Hello students, today we'll be working through chapter 3 uh, and the title of this chapter is Decision Making Under Conditions of Risk and Uncertainty. So we need to understand that decision making takes place in different environments. So uh, we spoke about uh, the amount of information that is available. Now this amount of information will determine the type of decision making that can take place, okay? So there's different um, decision making that takes place in an organization. So there's three main conditions. Firstly, it's decision making under certainty. So you know what's going to happen if you make a particular decision. Then you have decision making under uncertainty. So here we're trying to say that we do not have all the information. And then you have decision making under risk. So you have information in that you know there could be some negative um, or some alternate consequences to the decision that you take. So what differentiates these decision making environments is the information that we have available, right? So if it's decision making under certainty, that means we have complete information. We have all the information. We know what's going to happen. We know when it's going to happen when a particular decision is taken, right? So the decision maker here knows what is going on, what's going to happen. So this makes decision making easy. So you know if I go to the shop and um, I do, or I want to buy a product X, if they do not have product X, I'm going to buy product Y. So the decision making is clear and straightforward. Then we have decision making under risk and uncertainty. This means that we either have imprecise or incorrect information, or we do not have enough information, right? This obviously would complicate the decision making process. Yeah, we have your decision-making environments that we're going to continue talking about. So we say decision-making under risk involves having enough information, right? So this risk falls into that category of having the information, knowing the possible outcomes, and what is the probability of a particular outcome. Decision-making under uncertainty, on the other hand, here you do not have all the information. So you lacking certain information about what will happen in the future, right? So uncertainty also means that the decision maker cannot use any probabilistic estimates. So you can't say that there's a 50% chance that you're going to wait in an accident or there's a 50% chance that there's going to be some opportunity for the organization, right? So all decision maker can do is to make an optimistic or pessimistic prediction, right? Based on their experience, based on their knowledge of the environment. But they cannot say with certainty or uh, absolute probability what the outcome would be. Right? So since risk conditions um, deal with the amount of information you have, so the better quality information you have, the better decision uh, is going to be taken, okay? So we also make use of different decision-making tools that we use under certain conditions of risk. Now, these tools will help us to decide which information or which decision we need to take, right? There's also different um, aspects of the tool that can maybe compensate for a little bit of a, de a deficient or deficit in the information. Um, we also need to always remember that these decision-making tools have limitations. It depends on what conditions it is being applied to. So the first tool that we want to discuss is the expected monetary value, also what we refer to as EMV. So this is one of the tools that we can make use of when we are making decisions in risk management. So what is EMV? 
the principle states that where the outcomes have monetary value. So there is a absolute uh, financial value that you can attach to outcome. And you know the probability of that outcome. For example, there's a 50% chance that um, outcome X would take place. There's a 30% chance of outcome Y. So if you know the probabilities and you know with each outcome what is the associated monetary value, then obviously the outcome with the largest expected monetary value should be selected. So the outcome where you would get the most financial return would be the outcome that you would select. Right? So this is a tool that is only looking at the monetary aspect. So we said that the tools have its advantages and have its disadvantages and its uses in different scenarios. Okay. So the EMV itself is the outcome most likely to prevail on average if the same event is repeated many times. So if you have the same event taking place, you are going to know what the average outcome would be for those particular or that particular circumstance. So how do we get your expected monetary value? We calculate the sum of each outcome. So each outcome, but remember we said each outcome is weighted down. And you see they're weighted down by the probability of its occurrence. So you're going to add all of that up and then you're going to decide on which decision to take. Therefore, if we have an investment, so let's look at this carefully. Let me put on the pointer also. Here we go, we have a pointer, where's the pointer? Right, so to get the EMV, we calculate the sum of each outcome weighted down by the probability of its occurrence. And then we're going to use this example here. So we have an investment with a 60% chance to earn a return of 100. So there you can see here in the first bracket, the return is expected to be 100, but there's a 60% chance of this being achieved. For the, therefore, you are timesing the 100 by 0.6 or times in the 100 by the 60 percent then you have a 40 percent chance to lose 20. so in the second bracket you're going to add it up we said in the second bracket you can lose 20 so therefore we have the minus 20 and there's a 40 percent chance of this happening so therefore we have the 0.4 there and then our answer is 52. now remember your percentages or your probability, your probability will have to add up to 1. If you're working with percentages, your percentage has to add up to 100. So if we had the second one here, instead of 40%, we had there was a 20% chance to lose 20. Then there would be another option or alternative, say with another 20%. And maybe that would be another 20% um, chance to, to lose maybe 5 rand. Okay, so that is how you calculate your expected monetary value. Okay, so with any other tool, the EMV or the expected monetary value also has a limitation as a decision making tool, right? So we can't tell with absolute certainty or what degree of confidence um, the expected value of 52 comes with, right? And so it still comes down to a, a certain level of chance within the organization. So a key assumption of the expected monetary value is that the event leading to the outcome can be repeated many times over. And with this repetition is when you get the different possibilities of the different outcomes. Okay, so to use expected monetary value, all possible outcomes from an event are assumed to be known, right? So this is a big assumption. So therefore, we say you will use all tools with the caution that it needs to be used, okay? Um, so risk aversion or risk averse people often act in ways contrary to what um, the expected monetary value uh, suggests. Why is this? Because psychologically, we are conditioned 
to fear adverse outcomes, right? So we want to prevent or negate the effects of um, a negative outcome as much as possible, right? So we look at that in a more serious light than what we can look at the potential gain or the opportunity that we spoke about previously. We put more value on the fear versus what gain this particular decision can bring the organization, right? So your expected monetary value is widely applied. Remember, it's, it's a value that you have at, at the end. It's easy to compare different alternatives based on a value, okay? But we need to understand that um, it cannot work in conditions of uncertainty. Because you have to know specifically and precisely what the probabilities are. Remember we said your probability needs to add up to one. So you need to know specifically what these are in order to plug in the values into the expected monetary value um, tool. So the next tool that we're going to discuss is your probability theory. Now, probability, we know, measures the likelihood of an event occurring by assigning a value between 0 and 1, right? Risk always involves doubt, right? So whether you will achieve a particular objective or not. So risk involves doubt on the extent of an outcome if it has to occur. So a probability with a value of 1 means that the event that we are talking about is definitely going to happen, right? That's why we give it a value of one, meaning this is what's going to happen. Well, if you give something a probability of zero, it means that this event is unlikely to occur, okay? So there's three types of probability that we'll discuss. It's objective, subjective, and relative frequency. So application of each probability type depends on the problem that is facing a particular decision maker. So let's discuss each type of probability theory. So the first one is objective. This is known in advance. For example, the probability of tossing a coin, um, whether the coin lands on a heads or a tail, we can say there's a Okay, so still on probability theory, empirical probabilities are based on accumulated data over time. Remember, we spoke about an experiment being conducted for 100 times and then data being con um, accumulated over time. For example, if number of accidents that took place in a particular spot over a period of 10 years. So we accumulated data over time. Um, so reliability of empirical probability, it rests on the key assumptions that a large number of past events must have been observed. Right? You can determine the number of car accidents that took place in a particular province, for example, over a certain time period. Causal factors must remain stable or the same over time. For example, if we're looking at accidents that take place in the summer or the rainy season, right? The factors remain the same. So the environment is pretty much the same. The weather conditions, pretty much the same. So that's when you can do empirical probability. And thirdly, all possible outcomes from the event must be considered. So if one is a dominant outcome, um, you can assign a probability or know what could possibly happen, but you should not negate there are other possible outcomes, even if um, it occurred much fewer times in the period uh, being looked at. So frequent events present best empirical results and by implication, best empirical probabilities. And why is this? Because the more an event occurs, the more information we have, the more we learn about it, the easier it becomes to estimate um, the impact. So next 
we're going to discuss is your probability distribution. Now, this is a useful tool for risk evaluation. So knowing the probability distribution of outcomes from an event, it enables the determination of the most probable outcome, or alternatively, determine what the riskiness of this particular event is. So there's three types of distribution, um, specifically looking at risk management. You have the binomial distribution, the normal distribution, and the Poisson distribution. Now, using each of this distribution depends on what problem is facing the decision maker. Now, binomial, by, by is two, right? Distribution works on the two outcome situation. That means there's either a loss or a no loss. For example, with your car, you're either your car is stolen or your car is not stolen. There's no in-between point versus with the accident, you're not sure um, exactly how bad the accident would be. Some accidents are worse than others. Okay, so um, we use the example, I gave you an example already of the binomial distribution. Then we have your normal distribution, which is also a two-parameter distribution. Um, you would know we use this a lot for marks, and we always uh, find that the marks would be normally distributed. For example, we get a bell curve. Most of the students would fall um, in a particular range for a test, say 60 to 69, and then you'll have a few students on either end, a few students that are failing the test, so they'll be on the starting end of the curve and there will be a few students that do extremely well in the test. They will be on the latter end of the curve, right? So plotting the normal distribution requires the expected value. Okay, so what you expect the value or the outcome to be and what is the standard deviation from that expected value. So that's when you will plot and your normal distribution, we just said now, is your bell-shaped curve. And I use the class marks as um, an example of the normal distribution. Okay, then we have the Poisson distribution. So this, unlike the other two, this is a single parameter distribution. We said the other two were two parameters, right? Um, so this is a single parameter um, a distribution where the expected value of distribution serves as the single parameter. So worked examples using these distributions are available in your textbook. You will not be tested on the actual calculation on any of these um, probabilities, right? So probability distribution is a fairly useful tool um, when we are working with conditions of risk. Then we have the next tool that can be used, which is your expected utility theorem. Now, in order to understand this, we need to first understand what is utility. So this is a psychological measure of satisfaction, right, associated with one's owning or consuming a good. So how happy does buying a Mercedes car make you versus how happy does it make me? Okay, so that would be the utility that you assign to that particular um, activity of owning a particular car, right? So utility of a risk-averse person rests on two assumptions. The risk-averse is a person that would not particularly want to embark on risk or take unnecessary risks, right? One, increasing wealth leads to increasing levels of satisfaction, right? So the more money you get, the happy you, happier you are, right? Obviously, this is true up until a certain point. The marginal utility of wealth decreases as wealth increases. So when you don't have much, right? So it comes down to Maslow's hierarchy of needs also. So when you don't have much, then more money makes you happier, right? So you're able to get a suitable housing, uh, you get more money, you're able to buy a car, you get more money, you're able to take your family on holiday. But it comes to a point where it's increasing only up to a certain point. For example, once I become, like if I have 10 million in my bank account, getting more money is not going to make 
me happier. It's not going to give me more satisfaction because I already can do all the things I want to do with money. I can have a nice house. I can have a nice car. I can go on holiday. There's nothing else I really want uh, to do with money. So we say the marginal utility of wealth decreases as wealth increases, right? So the increase in wealth and satisfaction do not increase in a linear fashion, right? So you can assume that uh, up until a certain point, you can assume linearity, but obviously not for the entire relationship. Utility theory helps us to understand why people often take decisions that are in variance with what the expected monetary value is. For example, the EMV tool that we discussed, there, if the higher um, monetary value is expected, that is the decision you're going to take. We are saying only in now we are saying it's not a standard uh, decision that is um, taken across the board. There's other things that come into play. People value certainty over uncertainty. Okay, so I like to know what's going to happen versus not being unsure of what's going to happen even when uncertainty is associated with bigger gains, right? Okay, so as people gain more wealth, their satisfaction from each incremental item of wealth diminishes. So that's what we refer to as your diminishing marginal utility. So utility also helps us to understand the behavior of risk-averse people and it is um, taken that most of the population is risk averse, right? So when wealth is increasing together with satisfaction, so every time you get more money, um, it's increasing your satisfaction. People behave differently towards risk, right? Versus once it starts reaching diminishing marginal utility, um, obviously people's... Um, um, attitude towards risk then changes, right? So utility and risk aversion explain why people buy insurance, right? So as wealth increases, leading to diminishing marginal utility, risk aversion also tends to then diminish, right? So it can be said that the diminishing marginal utility influences the attitude towards risk. Right? So as wealth increases, individuals tend to be indifferent towards the risk. We use the example of purchasing insurance for a car. If you don't have much funds to replace the car, then you're going to make sure 100% that you have insurance on the car. However, if you have a large sum of money sitting in your bank account, you may choose to not purchase insurance because should something go wrong, you have the funds there to replace the vehicle. Right? So that's how you can see the diminishing marginal utility influences the attitude to risk. Okay, so there's other decision-making criteria that we can look at. However, it is not so applicable to risk management, but we'll just mention it so that you are aware. You have your maximum decision criterion. So what is this? This is the decision-making rule focusing on minimizing or avoiding the downside. Right? So we're not looking at the opportunity here. We just want to minimize um, the impact on this organization should a risk materialize. It is not concerned with the probability of an event occurring. Right? So you don't have that information. Maximum decision-making seeks to minimize monetary loss. So you are just trying to minimize the impact or the financial impact on this organization. So where insurance is involved, the application of this maximum decision criteria, this invariably results in the purchase of insurance because you want to minimize your loss. So you're paying every month 500 grand for car insurance, but you could have damages of 20,000 rand, okay? So by buying insurance, decision makers avoid or minimizes the monetary loss. Yes, you're losing money every month by paying the insurance, but it's not nearly as much as it would cost you 
um, should you uh, meet up in an accident. Okay, then we have the Minimax regret, which is the criterion. This seeks to minimize regret on the part of the decision maker. You don't want them to have any regret that they should have done something. So if used in the context of insurance, the Minimax regret criterion, like the maxima that we just discussed, results in the purchasing or the buying of insurance in order to minimize regret. Okay, then we have the maxi-max decision criteria. This is unlike the maximum and the mini-max um, that we just uh, discussed. Um, this uh, criterion is underpinned by the desire of the decision maker to exploit the upside of risk. Right? So you want to make the most of this risk to get the highest return. So it works on the assumption that the worst case scenario will not occur. Right? So that is, it's an assumption, remember? So where insurance purchase is involved, application of the maximax favors retaining the risk instead of buying things for it. So you won't pay every month for your month, um, insurance premium you will simply accept the risk within your organization. Should something happen to the vehicle or whatever asset, then you would absorb that cost in the organization. But it's also coming from the point of assumption that nothing is going to happen to that asset or vehicle. Right? So application of the maximum, minimax and the maximax decision-making processes do not feature prominently with the risk management. So we just mentioned it here in green. Um, but your EMV, your probability, and the utility has more value with regards to your risk management. Okay, so that brings us to the conclusion of this chapter. There are three decision-making environments that we are working with. Certainty, uncertainty, and risk environments. Um, certainty, obviously, there's no risk today because you know for sure. So we don't entertain too much of that in the in or that at all in the module. Risk and uncertainty complicate your decision making because you do not have all the information that you need to have, or you may have incorrect information. So um, due to this, we rely on different tools um, that can help us to fill the information gaps and to help us to make the decisions. So the main tools that we discussed today that relate to uh, risk management is your um, EMV, probability, and utility, right? Um, the usefulness of each decision-making tool or rule obviously depends on what the decision-maker is looking for. And again, it still will come down to the information 